All right, guys, we got a really great video today for Murmur MD. We are joined by our LAC channel moderator, LA Groves, director of Structural Heart of Mills Peninsula. And we have a celebrity guest ap uh, appearance here, Dr. Shafel Doshi, uh, electrophysiologist to the stars in Santa Monica. Uh, he is the director of the, um, of the Gully Rhythm Institute at St. John's uh, Providence Hospital. And he's probably one of the world's foremost experts in Watchman Flex um, technology and deployment. He was one of the very early implanters. And we're going to talk about some really cool data that he presented at the AF Symposium. And I think this will this is probably the first time anyone's put some data behind the ongoing debate about anatomic variability. And with two commercially approved LAC devices, really like which device works best in which anatomy. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to Shafel today and Elliot about this really cool data. So Shafel, welcome, brother. How are you, man? Thank you guys for having me. <clears throat> Appreciate being here and giving us a voice. Yeah, absolutely, man. So um, can you give us a little background on this post hoc analysis of Pinnacle Flex and kind of the background, and then we'll get into the actual data and some of the anatomic phenotypes you described? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks again to you guys and Murmur for having me. Um, you know, since probably I would say about 15 years, we've been really kind of caught up in different appendage anatomies, and we really haven't had a good scientific description. I think the original papers that came out probably came out when people were really hungry because we named anatomies based on food <laughs> particles like chicken wing and cauliflower, <clears throat> you know, cactus, broccoli, uh, with the exception of the one wind sock. And, and, you know, while these kind of are descriptive, you know, we do believe that the appendage anatomy is much more complex than that. So we sought, you know, a, a kind of a methodology to say, can we describe, you know, these anatomies based on, you know, more specific uh, uh, things such as angles and <clears throat> bifurcations and, and things of that nature. So we created some new categories, which I'll describe in a minute. But what was really unique is having the data from Pinnacle Flex. <clears throat> For those of you that remember, Pinnacle Flex was a prospective a uh, clinical trial uh, looking at a new um, iteration of Watchman, which the original iteration was called Watchman 2.5. <clears throat> and this device was called Watchman Flex. And it was a prospective study, but it was single arm. And it was a pivotal study for FDA approval for this novel device. And some of the unique features, obviously, as you know now, was, a, was one of the major aspects of it was a closed distal end. Uh, but because of the closed distal end, the device has kind of different properties in the way it deploys and the way it fixes to the left atrial appendage, <clears throat> very different from what we were used to at 2.5. Uh, and so, you know, part of the, the study, that one of the main focuses was, you know, closing the appendage, but also to minimize risk of embolization. And that was really our goal. Our goal wasn't necessarily to have complete closure, which we did really well on. And these were our first, first in human cases, really for most operators, you know, about 400 patients were actually enrolled with many patients in, in the initial uh, uh, arm where, where uh, physicians were just uh, getting experience with what we call roll-in. <clears throat> and so what we had in this study, though, was about 400 patients worth of really high-quality TEEs that were independently adjudicated. Uh, we captured all the data in terms of number of recaptures, procedure time, the depth. Uh, and now we could go back based on the new categories we created and try to understand these different anatomies and how we did. So Unless you have a prospective independently adjudicated study, it's really hard to do this uh, on registries uh, from multiple centers that aren't run this way. So Perfect. when we think about these new LAA categories, we try to come up with, you know, um, a, a specific number, maybe four to six kind of categories that kind of encompass most of the anatomies. I mean, you could essentially no two appendages are exactly the same. So you could make an infinite number of categories. But the five that you see are really what we came down with that really describe the anatomy uh, in a way that's that's uh, appropriate for how you implant the technique. So, you know, the first category is really the straight, no bend, uh, straight appendage, which you can see in, in a, probably a minority of cases. Um, what you see more commonly, though, are the appendages where you see the sweep, right, where you see the ostium is at one angle but the apex is at another. And in the old days, when we used to measure from the ostium to the apex, you know, it would be a really large number, but the, the actual, uh, you know, useful angle, which is perpendicular to where you have the ostium is where you would place the device. And we call that one kind of a sweeping angle. And then the, the third category was really anything that was formerly described as a chicken wing, 
but then you don't have anterior, posterior, that kind of stuff. Anything that really takes a sharp angulation. So it starts out one way, then almost goes 90 degrees in the other direction. And so that's what you see in category C. And oftentimes we still implant devices as if it was a straight angle device. We're ignoring uh, the sharp angle on the side, depending on the depth. Uh, and then what you start seeing more often uh, as you really start to understand these anatomies are, are what we call a whale tail, uh, where you have a, a standard angulation, but then you have lobes that go off on both sides and you need to, to deal with both of those. And then finally, I think the ones that are the most challenging are the ones that have bifurcations uh, yeah. and some that go even more proximally than the image show there. So these are the five categories that we kind of came up with as we were trying to put it together that would encompass the majority, if not uh, you know, all of the anatomies would fit into one of these categories. And so what we did from this is we went back uh, and we, we, we fit every patient into whichever category they went into. Then we looked at the cases uh, and, and we looked at you know, how many uh, recaptures it took for the case, what was the total time it took for the case, uh, efficacy of the case, et cetera. And, and that's how we came up with this abstract, really looking at you know, first uh, the success and then uh, you know, ways that we could kind of better understand the procedural times what anatomies does this device work well for? And again, we can't compare one device to another. So I'm not going to talk about a different iteration, a different type of device. We're looking at a single component device, uh, specifically uh, the Watchman Flex for this data. And it's hard to really say, well, you're taking this data, you can apply this to the 2.5 or you can apply it to a dual component device, uh, et cetera. I love it, man. How did you guys define implant success, Chase? <laughs> So, you know, in, this, in the study uh, back in 2018, implant success was defined as this arbitrary number, which was kind of consistent with standard of practice, which is a leak less than five millimeters. Okay. Um, it, now in 2024, I think we would consider implant success no leak. But at that time, and you know, that was kind of what was defined. And it was interesting. If you look back at the original Watchman data, not a lot of people realize this. In our original studies, going back to 2005, what was defined as a success was a leak of three millimeters or less. And then we did three plus or minus two. And the plus or minus two millimeters was really to allow for measuring variability between one operator and another, where they measured it, how they measured it, leading edge to trailing edge, et cetera. And somehow over convention, the three plus or minus two became just five. And so next thing you, now you're doing five and there's uh, gonna be variability. And we've kind of just taken that as kind of dogma and there's really no basis on the five, it was always three. Uh, and so, uh, you know, now in 2024, I think we consider success as really no leak because we realize that leaks have a consequence. Uh, that being said, though, in this study, when we looked at 45 days to 12 months, we had no leak identified in 90 percent of patients, which was significantly wow. better than what we had in Watchman 2.5, which was about 70 percent of patients, 67 percent. So we clearly, despite that not being our goal, because remember, our original goal in this study was to minimize risk of embolization. Because if you think back, before this study, there was a pre-version of the uh, Watchman Flex-like device, an early iteration which was released in Europe, which had slightly higher embolization risk. And hence that device was pulled off the market and redesigned. And so the first you know, goal of the study was to make sure we implanted without risk of embolization. Um, now, many of these cases in the study, we probably would be a little bit more cavalier about how we leave the device now in 2024, knowing what we know, perhaps to even have less uh, uh, leak and have more complete closure, but we still reach 90% complete closure. I love it. And it looks like in terms of the results, you know, a pretty high success rate independent of the anatomic subtype with a slightly longer procedure time for the sharp bend anatomy and for the shallower appendages. Yeah. Um, I was hoping to kind of to go through a little bit about your procedural technique for these various yeah. anatomies. If we go, if we go to the previous slide, um, can you talk about, so uh, of the more challenging subsets of this, can you talk a little bit about, cause I, one of the things I love about this is it helps you operationalize your procedure plan on the day of the procedure. So when you're looking at the TEE or you're looking at your ice images, or you're looking yeah. at your CET images, you can have a plan in your mind of how you're going to approach that appendage, both from your transeptal puncture, and from your deployment strategy. So yeah. can you walk us through kind of the more challenging subtypes and how you typically think about those on the day of the procedure? We can, we can start with 
you know, maybe the sharp bend or whichever ones yeah. you think are more challenging? Yeah. So, I mean, if we think about all the different anatomies, I think the one thing before we even get into the specifics is to recognize something different that was with the flex device compared to 2.5. And that was with the flex device, we realized that it was relatively simple to reposition and redeploy. Oftentimes with the 2.5 device, if you remember, we had to have the sheath deep in the appendage. Yeah. And so we would do a deployment and just take us, you know, a, a deep breath in saying, okay, it's deployed. It's not perfect. It looks good enough. Let's stop there. I'm not going to risk doing something else more. And, and what we learned with the flex is that, you know, you can get a much better result, you know, just by repositioning because the device is so much more compliant. It can do sometimes some, some unpredictable things. And so you can take that to your advantage. And what I mean by that is even minor changes in your angle or how you uh, advance or, or hold the device back will affect how the device is deployed. And so what I tell patient, uh, physicians that we're training is, look, if the device results, the first deployment results in a, an outcome where you say, that's pretty good. But if you think to yourself, it could be better and you've just done one deployment, you want to recapture and redo it again because this device allows you that flexibility. And what you see many of these uh, anatomies, we didn't do too many different things except just recapture and try to redeploy. That being said, we can go into specific techniques of these different anatomies, but just off the bat, what you find out is that for most anatomies, as long as you have the depth, you know, you have the depth that's at least half of the width of the of the anatomy of the of the device that you're going to use, then, you know, this device really works well for that. And it, it reminds me, and for those that are not electrophysiologists, we used to, you know, in the old days when we had, you know, only a few uh, leads to put for biventricular pacing, the companies would try to sell each other saying, mine has this shape, it's going to work better. Mine has the L shape, mine has the S shape. Uh, but at the end of the day, unless you do a randomized trial and you try both leads in the same anatomy, you can't really say one works better for one anatomy or the other. All you can say yeah. is, how well does your device work for all the anatomies? And so, you know, all these people are, you know, everyone's kind of comparing, well, for this, I would choose this. And, and the reality is, if you want a device that's safe, um, and we'll talk about safety in a minute, but, um, you know, you want to get really good at whatever device you're using. And try to use that for most anatomies because they do work. And, and as you can see here, this works for most anatomies. And again, I, I do believe that our outcomes are even better now in 2024 uh, than what they were in 2018. And these was, this was the experience of all the operators in the study. This was our first experience using this device. So we were still very, very you know, naive to the device. But if you look at the anatomies where, where we tend to have challenges, I think one that kind of Right off the bat, even with the old definition, one that always led people to get more concerned was what we used to call the chicken wing, which we're now calling a sharp angle uh, uh, or a sharp bend, if you will, uh, on the device. And if you look at just, and I don't know if you can go back, we can look at the actual, um, uh, yeah, that's the, the slide there where we're just looking at the five different definitions, looking at that sharp angle. Um, and if you look at that sharp angle, what you realize is that many of these cases, you have enough depth to go straight down and ignore that side angle, right? And so uh, oftentimes what you end up doing is if you don't size the device correctly, the device falls into that distal lobe, into the angle. And that's where you have a lot of problems later on where a device is sitting perfectly flush and as the appendage remodels, it may fall in, right? And so one of the, the tricks about this kind of anatomy now is that we choose a device not on the width of, of the appendage, we choose a device based on the length that we want. So now we're targeting the length of the device. So I measure from the distal end of the appendage where before it takes the angle, just straight to the back wall and measure up to the osseum. And I say, okay, that measures uh, you know, 24 millimeters. Okay, so I want a device that's gonna be longer than that sticking out and I wanna choose a length because with Flex, it's a safe device. The distal ball is very compliant. You're not worried about the pulmonary artery and, and these kinds of things. You know, you're, you're basically taking that distal ball to the end of it and opening the device. And I want to choose a device that may be a little bit more compressed, but that's definitely long enough so it sticks out above the angle, far enough above that there's no chance it's going to fall in. So we tend to size devices in this anatomy based more on the length than the width. So that's number one. Uh, number two with this anatomy, what you realize is if the angle goes very acute and goes very anterior, similar to what you see here in C, which if this is a TEE, this is what we used to consider an anterior chicken wing, right? And when you, when you start having to get your, your angulation more anterior, 
we find that the sticks, the puncture, the transeptal is better being more anterior. So we used to say traditionally, you know, for, for all these appendage closures, you go posterior and uh, as posterior as you can, the more anterior the anatomy is because you want to try to get coaxial. What happens when you go very posterior is that the, the accumulated ridge gets in your way and you're not able to counter torque the device up superiorly. So now for any kind of anatomy that has this type of uh, uh, sharp angulation going anteriorly, we tend to stick low in general because you want to go from the bottom up. But then we also want to stick a little bit more closer to the anterior side. Now, I don't want people to ideally stick the aorta. That's not what I mean. What I mean is if you have the midpoint, which you consider mid, and you'd always go posterior to that mid, I want you to go a little bit more anterior to that mid. So you're just a little bit more anterior, but definitely not posterior. And you still want to do it safely. And what that allows you to do, it allows you to approach the angle where you're not coming you know, perpendicular to the orifice this way, you're coming straight down to the orifice. And then you can counter torque with the flex ball in place. Um, and that really helps you align it. But the other unique thing that is used for this anatomy that not many people are familiar with is a way to actually angle the flex device. The tradition's always been get the sheath where you want and just unsheath it. So you got to really counter torque and, and counterclockwise the sheath yeah. to get it anterior and then untorque it. We stopped doing that so much now because you can really manipulate the flex device. And I'll explain in a minute. Um, you know, most of the trauma that happens is when you have a stiff sheath anywhere near the distal end of the appendage. So what I always say with the flex device, you don't need to do that. And you shouldn't do that. So all of you with the old habits of having the sheath deep in the appendage and then opening the device, you need to stop that. Uh, and we'll talk about safety in a minute. But you have the flex ball and you have the sheath at the ostium. You never go into the appendage without a flex ball at the end. So you have the whole system you can advance with a soft flex ball like a pigtail. You never have the sheath deep. And so because of that, what the flex has unique properties is the flex is a compliant device. It can bend in the middle. Okay, but where it bends is in the middle of the device. So what you can do is you can advance a device to a position that you want. And you know you want to get it more anterior, but you can't because you have to really counterclock the sheath. So what you can do is as you're releasing the device, and you're about halfway down, you start clocking. You do the opposite maneuver and you bend the device so it kind of bends and you push out so it bends up like this, almost like you're trying to jackknife a truck, right? You're backing up with a trailer hitch and you kind of go in the other direction. So there are a lot of these techniques now we've learned. And if you were at the AF Symposium, you saw a live case uh, done by uh, the Mass General Group where they were having a lot of difficulty engaging this appendage, which was 35 millimeters, so they use a 40 millimeter device, the Flex Pro, and they couldn't get the device to sit because it would just swing out and fall out. And yeah. so we asked them to do this jackknife maneuver, which after multiple recaptures in a single attempt, they got the device to sit in position. So these are some important kind of techniques, which I think is really unique for this, this uh, sharp angulation. And then when you come to, you know, the whale tail and, and the bifurcation, um, uh, type anatomy. Sometimes these are overlapping. Sometimes the whale tail will have a lot of bifurcations. And the challenge for any device, doesn't matter whether it's this device, 2.5 device, a dual component device, is when you have trabeculations that come right up to the ostium. That yeah. it really doesn't allow any device to open so that you can have a coverage at the top. And you saw a live case uh, if you were at the ISLA Symposium, the International Symposium for Left Atrial Appendage, um, we saw a live case done from Mount Sinai where they had multiple trabeculations coming to the ostium and um, uh, they tried to deploy an amulet device. But, you know, for any device, the challenge is what seats inside these trabeculations that you can cover with the disc. And that was also a failed implant. So those are the ones that you have the most, uh, you know, apprehension for is when you have the trabeculations right up to the ostium. But if you don't have that, then and you have... Uh, for example, the image that you see in E, which is a bifurcation with the flex, you have the option of trying that ball in different, in different areas of that appendage. So you can try to put that ball in the anterior kind of aspect to the right of the trabeculation. You can try to put it in the left. You can try to just kind of land it right in the middle. And you can't predict which one of those is going to land perfectly. But the important thing is to have you know, forward tension on the device so it doesn't pop out and you allow those anchors to catch. But um, and I think the bottom line, what we've learned is unless 
the anatomy by measurement is either way too small or way too big, then for most of these anatomies, we would at least try to do an implant, especially if you're experienced, the likelihood is that you'll have success. I love it. So can you talk a little bit about Schaefel, the the heavy trabeculations? Because that for me is the case when I look at the TEE and I see these deep finger-like trabeculations going all the way to the ostium. And I know what I'm going to get, you know, even with a perfect deployment, you still see that kind of like leak through the trabeculations to the other sides. And I know some operators oversize, some undersize. Elliot, what do you do with these, with the, the super trabeculated appendages? Do you use, do you use yeah, any I mean, of those or do you oversize the device? What, what's your strategy? Those are certainly the ones I probably struggle with the most these days, now that we've gotten better at the chicken or the artist formerly known as poultry. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try to go as big as possible with the ones where the trajectory try to smash them over. But we, as you guys know, some of them are compliant, some of them aren't. So some of those trabeculations you can displace and, and get a good result, and some don't really. I mean, I have tried, I have found in, in my personal, in, in Chevel's, comment about this that if you fail with a watchman this like magic thought that amulet's going to be perfect and it won't fail is is not true um usually if an appendage is hard an appendage is hard to close um and so i've tried amulets sometimes and with some success with some lack of success sometimes you end up accepting a slightly you know imperfect result but yeah those are the ones that i've struggled with most but i think to answer your question oversizing the device uh, getting a little bit more compression and trying to just smash everything over and with a little bit more of a muffin top is how I've dealt with those, those trabeculations that go back all the way to the ostium. And I had a couple of questions for you about the, your de deployment technique, two, two questions about your, the jackknife technique. When you're pushing in with the ball, do you, do you wait and see kind of the distal end when it starts deflecting and then you start deploying and clocking? Is that kind of? Yeah. And uh, before I even say that, I hope you weren't uh, thinking of muffin top after seeing me on screen. And that was really <laughs> a reflection of, of what you do there. But uh, I agree with you. Um, I pretty much try to leave a muffin top on every appendage that I can. You know, this this notion that we used to have to have this perfectly flush lining, you know, it leaves you at risk potentially if the appendage remodels and the, and the device isn't all the way at the back end. And it could potentially fall in and out. So I try to leave a little bit of a, of a muffin top on, on most of those implants. And when you have a really large device, um, you know, a long, it ends up being longer, right? So you might have more coverage. The concern is always, does that distal end open up enough? Is it going to be anchored? And I think the challenge with, uh, with, with what we're talking about is the risk of complication. So as we looked at the surpass data, and this is to me the most powerful thing, you know, if you, have an appendage closure and you have no pericardial effusion, right? The risk of mortality is one in a thousand. If you think wow. about that, the average age is 80 something. These are sick people and the mortality rate is one in a thousand based on NCDR really? because that's hard to hide, time of mortality before your discharge, right? So it's one in a thousand. If you have a pericardial effusion, your mortality rate goes up 60 times to 6%. Wow. So we have to temper our excitement for closing everything, looking also at the risk of pericardial effusion. And how do you ethically consent somebody if you think that risk is going to be substantially higher for, uh, you know, and that's why you have to choose your patients accordingly um, now that we, we have the ability to, to, to do that. So, um, you know, back to your question about, about uh, the technique, you know, it's not one of those perfect things. It's just sometimes it's trial and error. So I try to open that device up and I start clocking early. And if I'm clocking too early, it goes, it goes down. And I'm like, oh, that's too much. Okay, so go back, pull out a little bit more, start clocking. And then when you find the right mix, it'll instead of swinging down, it'll swing like up. So it's just fine tuning. So I start kind of right as the ball starts to come out, I start to clock a little bit and then see which way the ball is going. If it's going in the wrong direction, I, I undo my clock a little bit, come back a little more, clock a little more. And then right when I feel like, oh, it's turning, that's when I'll push the device forward and clock at the same time. Got it. So, and, and sometimes it takes three or four times, you know, it's just like finding the right balance to get it to, to do that kind of swing, if you will. I think we should call that the Doshi maneuver instead of the... Uh, I thought that was my maneuver was the muffin top, but I'll, I'll take that <laughs> over the muffin top. Now I'm really hungry, dude. We got chicken, <laughs> top, cauliflower, uh, we can make a nice meal yeah. out of it. And what about the heavily trabeculated appendages, Dosh? What do you what do you do with that? I mean, I, I as, just as you guys mentioned, um, that that sometimes is a crapshoot. I try to do the same thing and try to go a little bit bigger, just so that my 
you know, um, the device will sit a little bit further out, but I never want to violate leaving more than, you know, ideally leaving more than uh, a third of the device sticking out. Sometimes we get a little bit comfortable leaving a little bit more, but you have to really understand where the anchors are. And it is my hope that next iteration of Watchman Flex will have the, the anchors more radio opaque. Because to me, that's super helpful. If I do an angio and I can see exactly where those anchors are, then I'm a little bit more comfortable. And if you understand the flex anatomy, you see the, the pattern on fluoroscopy at the very proximal end of the device, it's like a honeycomb. And then you see these straight struts that go out after it. And it's in the middle of that second straight strut that the anchor is. And so if you look very carefully and if you, if you kind of study this and learn this, you can identify where that anchor should be. And as long as that proximal anchor is in tissue, because the distal row of anchors to me is not enough. Uh, as long as that proximal end is tissue, then you allow yourself to have more of uh, a, um, uh, a, a hangover off the mitral annulus um, and you leave yourself a shoulder. Um, but you're a little bit more comfortable with that if you know where the anchors are. So I think the technique of just going bigger because you know that you're not going to be able to open up because you're too deep in the appendage and the trabeculation. So hopefully something catches and then the proximal end really opens up, um, you know, um, at the appendage. So I think that's probably the technique, just being careful and mindful. You know, the one thing to note is that one of the, the, the nice things about this device is we really haven't seen the signal for embolization with this device uh, when you have uh, no more than, than a third sticking out, you know? So we want to maintain that safety, uh, you know, when we're doing this. And, and that's, I think the biggest risk is when you have these trabeculations is risk of embolization. Yeah. And so last question I have, Dosh, what, what would you say, because this is, it confuses me, but there's a lot of implanters now doing pre-procedural CT, looking at the CT, yeah. And then trying to decide whether this anatomy is better for an amulet or a watchman. So what would you say to those folks? Because now we have two commercially approved vice, like yeah. similar to the Taver space where it's like, do we do an yeah. Evolute or a Sapien? What would you say to those folks? Because this data kind of suggests that, you know, you could probably just do a day of procedure TEE and plan on watchman. You know, I mean, what? Yeah, the, the whole uh, the whole pre-imaging thing is is kind of interesting. And I have a very biased perspective. And. You know, I, I think when we did it in the days before imaging, we kind of figured things out. And I, and I asked the question today, if you had a fellow learning how to do coronary angiography, would you teach him LAO, REO, cranial, caudal, or do you just say, do the CT first so you know the coronary anatomy and then do the angio so you know what's going on? No, <laughs> you, you learn how to do it fluoroscopically, right? And your brain can process pretty quickly. And if you kind of learn some of the basics of TE, and fluoroscopy, you can kind of figure out on the fly, do I need to have the device open on the table? Or can I, does it, how long does it take for someone to open the package and flush the, the size of the device? So that's my bias. I think, look, in the beginning, it's good to have as much imaging so you kind of understand what those images mean. But if we're trying to get to a position where maybe in the future, if Laos 4 is positive and every appendage should be closed on top of anticoagulation, then maybe we need to simplify the procedure. And, and I think the number one thing about procedural choose, choice of devices, you got to be safe. And, you know, and that lends to my comment about pericardial fusion. So whichever device users, is very few people that do high volume of both devices, right? And so, yeah. you know, in the U.S. right now, about between 92 to 95 percent of the implants are Washroom Flex. Amulet is between 5 and 7 percent. And so if you're doing, if, if that's your experience where you're doing flexes all day and every now and then you do an amulet, you're not going to be as experienced with the amulet, right? So I think you have to, one, choose your experience knowing that the most anatomies can probably be closed with both devices, but you got to be really good at the one device you're really good at if that's what your practice is. And I would say you want to look at the data from the devices independently of the other devices. So look at the data on the amulet studies. And look at the rate of pericardial effusion. Look at Emerge LAA. Look at the rate of pericardial effusion. And look at the rate of pericardial effusion with Watch and Flex. And, and you're not comparing head to head because there really isn't good head to head data uh, out there that we can really rely on. Uh, then that's, I think, the first thing you should look at is that you need to be safe. You need to consent your patient that this is the reality. One has a pericardial effusion rate of X, the other one has a pericardial effusion rate of Y. And then be yeah. really comfortable with the device you choose. And for those, that are very comfortable with one particular you know, device, whether it's flex or amulet, really use that as your uh, you know, first device for most anatomies. Uh, there's a rare exception to that rule,
But what's interesting is that oftentimes TEE doesn't give you the, all the information. CT certainly doesn't give you everything. What CT misses are the trabeculations, right? Yeah. You can't often see some of these fine trabeculations. What TEE misses is often the depth of the device. And so that's why I think where even just going in and doing the angio on top of what you have shows you that you could close most anatomies, for example, with the watch reflex, uh, as you see here. So you may be misled by what you see on echo until you really do the angio and you open that up and you see how it flowers that, oh, you know what? I should be able to get my ball into that anatomy. So in our experience, what we first started doing is we, we tried to select specific anatomy. We say this one is going to be really, really tough. This is going back to the commercial launch of Amulet. We found that our Amulet experience was low enough at the time that, you know, we weren't doing ourselves any favors. And the patients that were referred who had failed Watchmans, we actually had successful Watchman Flex implants. So we just were had more experience doing that type of device. So we had more success with that. So I think at the end of the day, stick with what you know, the device that you know well, know the data about safety. And, and then I would try that device first for most anatomies. I think that's a really wise point. So Elliot, any follow up on that? No, I mean, that's a great point. I think that the point about safety is so important. I mean, because not 100% of these patients are totally, uh, you know, contraindicated for anticoagulation. Right. So if you're hurting somebody with a procedure, you're not really in the end benefiting them. Um, you know, obviously we want to close that appendage, but yeah, I mean, safety is so important. And particularly moving forward with this procedure being somewhat, you know, not, it shouldn't be anymore, but it is to some degree controversial. There's some loud voices uh, who oppose it. You, you, safety is so key. If you're, if you're not having complications, it's hard for them to be as anti LAC as, as they have been in the past. Yeah. I love it. And then when you're done with the watchman, send them to Shafel for a PFA ablation, right? Is that the, that's the, uh... absolutely. It'll be probably <laughs> just as fast. I love it. Well, Shafel, Elliot, thank you guys. This was a really great discussion. I think we learned a lot. Um, and I think this is really important data moving forward so that we can really talk to one another about different anatomies and operationalize it and put some data behind this uh, idea that certain anatomies are better for certain devices. And, uh, and thanks so much for doing this, Shafel. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. That was, that was really great.